Tonight on We're Speaking. The insurrectionist violence on January 6 was incited by fascist Donald Trump, numerous members of Congress, and networks like Fox News, who spread misinformation, disinformation, and conspiracy theories about the election. They've stoked racial division and even encouraged violence. We need to step up and stop the funding of fascism. Author and historian Jennifer Murcia joins us to discuss Tuesday's January 6 hearings and to put the fight against fascism into sharp focus. We're Speaking starts now. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Lincoln Project. We're (laughs) Speaking. It's been a week. Yeah. Uh, I am here. It's only Wednesday. We're Speaking co host (laughs) Maya May. I'm Lisa Senegal. Hi. Whew. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's been a week, or it's at least been twenty four hours. Um, I was that, to say, yeah, yeah, it feels like a week. The House Select Committee um, on January six started yesterday, um, as I'm sure everyone knows. If you've either watched it or you've seen the clips, it was gut wrenching, um, terrifying at times, really heartbreaking, and there was inspiring testimony from all four of the officers who testified these guys are heroes and you know once again they were putting themselves at risk um, by helping our country find the truth this time um so you know i hope this begins the long march toward truth and accountability We've got to have that. We'll see if we can get there. Yeah, I was like, big eye roll there. Um, because, yeah, accountability is something that uh, I didn't see a lot of in the last 24 hours. Um, what I saw a lot of was the GOP basically twisting language, doing verbal gymnastics, uh, trying to deflect from the truth. And, you know, this is the thing, like when we talked to our children about lying uh, when, when we were kids and we learned about lying. It was like, never tell a lie because then you have to tell another lie and another lie and another lie. And that's what I feel like the GOP has done. Basically, they've backed themselves into the corner with so many lies. And they think that lies are going to be the thing that are going to get them out of it. Um, and just want to really hone in on the language of these lies. Um, Because basically, like, all of these politicians got caught trying to overturn an election, and it didn't work. They weren't anticipating that part. It didn't work. And so they used language like, yeah, this exactly, which is why it's so important that we're talking about this tonight. You know, they talked about giving tours to tourists um, who later caused millions of dollars in damage, assaulted people, um, and stole stuff for souvenirs, I guess they were. Um, the fact is they're blatant liars uh, and their lies have created a crisis of faith in our electoral system and in our democracy as well. And at this point, we have to call them out on it. They're lies. Yeah, they're absolute lies. Um, you know, and and why did, why did this happen? Why did January 6th occur because of course these pa- these people are patriotic right they right. they had to do this because they're patriots and what could possibly be more patriotic than like beating police officers with an american flag right this is the flag that we can't take a knee before because that's disrespectful but it's not disrespectful to beat police officers with it um yeah, the, you're absolutely right. These people were not tourists who were there. They were terrorists. And, and we've got to use the word, call it what it is. They were domestic terrorists. Yeah, just straight up terrorists. And people had to fight them. People had to fight for us, right? And that's the thing, like lives were actually lost. Uh, here's Officer Michael Fanone. He's with DC's Metropolitan Police Department. And he started his law enforcement career as a US Capitol officer shortly after 9-11. It's important to watch this testimony. The indifference shown to my colleagues is disgraceful. My law enforcement career prepared me to cope with some of the aspects of this experience. Being an officer, you know your life is at risk whenever you walk out the door, even if you don't expect otherwise law-abiding citizens to take up arms against you. 
but nothing, truly nothing, has prepared me to address those elected members of our government who continue to deny the events of that day, and in doing so, betray their oath of office. So, of course, the GOP response is to continue to deny the events of the day. Um, the propagandists and members of the GOP went into hyperdrive after the testimony yesterday. Take a look at this from Laura Ingram's show last night. She was handing out acting awards to these heroes who testified. And for best performance in an action role, the winner is Michael Fanon. Too many are now telling me that hell doesn't exist or that hell actually wasn't that bad. The indifference shown to my colleagues is disgraceful. This is so upsetting every time I watch it, that the trauma, you, anyone who has experienced trauma, watch the four of those officers testify yesterday and knew that when they were reading those statements, when they were answering those questions, they were re-experiencing the trauma that they had on January 6th. And to have the people whose lives they were trying to save, did save, now gaslighting them. Right. <laughs> and they have to go and relive this trauma on camera. And it wasn't even just their, their own trauma, they were, re-experiencing the trauma that they watched happen to all their fellow officers. And they were doing this when they put themselves in harm's way again, being willing to go there and testify in all the public appearances that Michael Fanone has made. He is putting himself in harm's way and he knows that. And he's doing it because he's a patriot, because he loves this country. For Laura Ingram, to have the temerity, the uh, mendacity to think that, that she can sit in judgment and for her amusement, make fun of these men. I, I just, I, you know, they, they fought for their own lives. They fought for other people's lives. L Laura Ingram fights nothing but mass vaccines and the truth. And she is just, among many others, an absolute disgrace. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing is disgusting. Like the fact that that is like, they couldn't even wait a day. Like it was almost like the writers were sitting around going like, okay, how can we just be absolutely terrible? How can we distract from what's happening here by being terrible, but we're not distracted at all. You know, and in general, like my philosophy is do no harm, but take no shit, right? Um, but we've reached the part where I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I'm done with this shit. Like, and we all should be done with this shit. And I feel like collectively as a country, we've gotten to the point where we're like, no, 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 you're not gonna straight up lie to us over and over again to our faces. We all saw what happened on January 6th. We saw what those officers went through. We watched them tear up during their testimony, yeah. okay? And like Lisa said, like this is trauma re-experienced over and over again. And to laugh, like one of the Fox News anchors had a nerve to, to laugh at that uh, trauma. I believe it was Tucker Carlson who was basically like, oh, like psychological trauma, like, oh, boo hoo. Uh, everybody knows that psychological trauma is very real. And to mock that for people who are actually trying to protect our democracy is it's it's freaking disgusting. And I think what's most important, though, like when I try to get through my rage, because I've been feeling a lot of rage, is to understand that what they're doing is strategic. They're not accidentally lying. It is all a part of their strategy, uh, which is why I'm glad that we were able to uh, get our guest for tonight because yeah, she's I'm, shed some light on it. Yeah, yeah, we we had this incredible woman on not that long ago, so we are so thrilled to have our friend Jennifer Murcia back with us tonight. She is a scholar of rhetoric really important to be understanding what rhetoric is and how it's being used. And she's a professor of communication at Texas A&M. 
She's also the author of Demagogue for President, The Rhetorical Genius of Donald Trump, and articles with titles like Dangerous Demagogues and Weaponized Communication, which is, we're seeing a lot perfect. of. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I can't imagine a more perfect guest to expose the communication yeah. weapons being used against the American people by the authoritarian right. Uh, and the last time she was with us, we also talked about rhetoric And so we will identify some of these uh, in the GOP statements in reaction to yesterday's hearing so that we can be more informed. But before we bring her on, which we're really eager to do, we do want to hear from all of you. As you know, the politicians who push the big lie that led to the insurrection, they get their funding from, among others, corporate donors and huge amounts of money from corporate donors. These massive corporations like Fox, they're actively working to undermine our democracy. So we asked you, who do you think is the worst offender and why? And here are some of your responses. So we have Susan Bonser on Facebook, says the Rupert Murdoch family, the Koch family, Mark Zuckerberg and his social media properties, the RNC, and any Republican who joins the distribution of lies. It's the people with the money who are making the decision to lie to the American people and have the resources to implement it. Uh, Kara Tafoya Herndon wrote, Tucker Carlson, because he has 0% regard for democracy or truth in facts. He cares only for ratings and the adulation of Trumplicans. He cares nothing for America or Americans. And we have Bruce Rickett, Hannity, Carlson, Ingram, Dobbs, and the alt-right political reprobates in Rupert Murdoch's Fox News neoliberal and white supremacist propaganda in quotes, entertainment network. Yeah, you're absolutely right. All the companies working behind the scenes to fund the Republican attempts to suppress the truth, they're dangerous and they have to be held accountable by us, by their employees, by the Lincoln Project. Yeah, and we did notice that an overwhelming number of you pointed to Fox as the biggest threat to our democracy. So we are ex so excited. I'm incredibly excited to have Jen Jennifer talk to us about that tonight and how we can fight back. And part of the way that we fight back is by our numbers, fighting back as a community. And we're speaking, we're not just a show, we are a community that you are all part of. So your input is really crucial to building this movement. Yep, you can use the hashtag we're speaking. Uh, you can tag us on Twitter, Twitter at LPTV. Lisa's at LC Senecal and I'm at Maya on stage. And please keep the conversation going. We love to hear your thoughts. And we also love, uh, love it when you laugh with us and joke with us because it does keep us engaged and keep our energy up uh, while we're Insane. In, in this fight. Insane, yeah. Insane <laughs> is good. Sometimes, you know, it's a finger hold. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and so we do appreciate it. Really uh, do. Coming up next, our amazing guest, the brilliant Jennifer Murcia is going to be joining us. But first, a message from the Lincoln Project, and we're going to reveal our first Oh For Fuck's Sake Award nominee, and my God, are you in for a treat tonight. Our first nominee for this week's Offs Award is Tucker Carlson. You may have seen Tucker earlier this year in Let's Accost People Who Wear Masks Outside, a riveting performance indeed, but then not to outdo himself, just last week he appeared in the titular role of the sequel, Accosted, Bait and Tackle, shot on location in Montana. Congrats on the nomination, Tucker. Even guys who fish want to cancel you for trying to bait a So how do you convince corporate America this is not a normal time? They have a lot to lose personally for the executives, professionally for the people that work there, and economically for, you know, their bottom lines. At this point, it's less about convincing them 
and more about if the public can continue to be invested in this issue so that they see that that moment has not passed. Because I think if they believe that the moment has passed, you'll just see everything return to normal. Do you miss me yet? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 45th president of the United States of America, Donald J. If I lost this election, I could handle it pretty easily. Two questions. Have you yourself gotten vaccinated, and do you disagree with the Republican plan? Well, your, your first question is a violation of my HIPAA rights. We were trying to come up with a rifle that we thought was appropriate for a general. This is uh, one of our top quality guns. And, uh... Maybe I'll find somebody in Washington, D.C. <laughs> the county has, for whatever reason, also refused to produce the network routers. We want the routers, Sonny. Wendy, we got to get those routers, please. It's the number one fast food uh, company in America. It's good food, good service at a reasonable price. Come on, Kelly, we can get those routers. Those routers, you know what? It, we're so beyond the routers. Hi, Senator. I am a proud Kentucky citizen, and I just wanted to tell you to get They don't want to give up the routers. They don't want to give them. They are fighting like hell. There are children skinny people who have died of the coronavirus. Do you feel any responsibility? <laughs> Why are these commissioners fighting not to give the routers? Dude, you are the worst human being I've known to man. I want you to know that we're going to this state, to the United States, to everything else in this world. They make up a lot of crap, and they say it over and over and over, and one day you say, oh, if you got those routers, what that will show. Welcome back. Tonight, we are speaking about the January 6th insurrection, the select committee hearings that have just started, and the enablers who not only watched the insurrection happen, but actively encouraged it. Yeah, we are super excited to have our friend Jennifer Murcia back to join us tonight. Hey. Hello, Jennifer. She is a scholar of rhetoric and professor of communications at Texas A&M University. And she also shares my love for stress baking, or what I like to call <laughs> rage baking. <laughs> Blueberry yeah. bars yesterday. <laughs> yes, I saw the bars on Twitter last night. We're, we're going to go we're on good. and on about how amazing you are. So Jennifer has, oh, no, no, you're just, yeah. you're going to have to sit back and listen to us sing yeah. your praises because, you know, you're yeah. that, <laughs> you're that. Oh. Um, yeah. She's written articles with titles like Dangerous Demagogues and Weaponized Communication and the Emergence of the Outrage Presidency. She also wrote a book that the Washington Post called one of the most important political books of this perilous summer. Not bad. Um, yeah, so stress baking. We did see that last <laughs> night. Um, I, they look so good. Yeah. <laughs> like, Yesterday was good, stressful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> gooey and oh yeah if <laughs> if nothing else good can come out of everything that's happening right now at least baked goods are having yeah. a renaissance because we're all stressed <laughs> baking and eating so yes yeah. something um <laughs> jennifer we've we've seen kevin mccarthy um echoed by the right-wing propaganda network um, the whole ecosphere attempt to control the narrative about the validity of the January 6th committee uh, before it even started. So what's he doing? What's what's really happening there? Yeah, so to me, um, the January 6th committee is really um, this interesting case study that sort of um, shows the entire ecosystem, you know, and the difference between, um, you know, reality or the mainstream media or, I don't know, I don't know how else to say that. <laughs> reality is the good one. <laughs> um, versus what I've really begun to think of as the manufacturer of dissent community, um, which is the one that is, you know, anchored by right-wing media. Um, 
And what I mean by the manufacturer of dissent is not only do we see the production of, you know, an insurrection, um, you know, and, and everything that led to that. So the conspiracy theory, you know, the paranoia, the, the whole argument that politics is war and the enemy cheats, um, you know, all of that framing that we've seen over the last five years so successfully deployed. Um, but I also mean that they dissent um, to everything, right? Like it's layer upon layer upon layer of dissent. So it's not just, you know, we want to attack um, the counting of the electoral college votes, um, but it's we want to attack reality. We want to attack definitions, right? We want to attack, um, you know, every single part of, of everything that makes up the reality-based community. So we deny science, we deny legitimate authority figures, we deny literal definitions of words. <laughs> um, and, and instead we create a different reality. Um, and it's, I mean, it's fascinating and horrifying at the same time. Um, but to me, it's that manufacture of dissent that you see deployed by people like McCarthy um, and, and all of the rest of the ecosystem. Yeah, it's so crazy to me because it's like they refuse to adapt to actual reality. And so they're like, yeah. let's just create a reality that I like where I fit in. It's a very bizarre strategy. Um, I, I know it's not going to work. Um. Yeah, it's 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 been going on, though, I mean, for at least the last 20 years. Right. And so we've reached this point now where, um, you know, the Internet has allowed everyone to participate in the cre creation, construction of this reality on the right wing um, side. But it's really been, you know, 20, 30 years in the making. So, you know, first emerging on right wing talk radio, right? Of course, you have Fresh Limbaugh, um, Fox News, uh, blogs, you know, there's a whole ecosystem that has developed over 30 years, um, you know, and it's created a reality. A lot of people who are Republican don't remember a reality outside of the reality that's been developed for them. Um, and so I really liked your point, Maya, about, you know, when you teach a kid not to lie, it's because there's going to be layer upon layer upon layer. You're never going to stop lying. Well, it's the same thing with this reality that they've created. Um, you know, they have to defend it. Uh, you know, if they all of a sudden you know, sort of recognize the authority of the Constitution or the authority of Nancy Pelosi or, you know, the right, like the right and good thing to do, um, you know, then that negates the whole construction, the whole edifice that they've built up. Um, right. And so but it's really interesting. It's so scary. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, this, this piece really fascinates me because it is layer upon layer of lies and very often the lies are completely contradictory and they have managed to groom their followers uh, to the point that they can switch from one lie to another lie and everybody just like, okay, so now we're here and this is reality <laughs> and, and they're okay with that. Um, so what, what stops this? Because now, now the GOP, after saying forever that this wasn't, you know, it wasn't really a big deal. Nothing really happened on January 6th. Now it's a big deal and it's Nancy Pelosi's fault. Mm -hmm. Right. So one of the things that um, has really helped me to understand how this process works is reading Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism. And I'm sure y'all have read it. Um, but there's a part where she talks about um, how the followers of the Democratic Socialist Party were uh, both gullible and cynical, that they believed everything that their side said and nothing that the other side said. Um, and it was that cynicism that propelled them through, because even if they discovered that uh, they were being lied to, they enjoyed it because they believed that all of politics was a lie. And so, you know, if our side is better at lying than their side, then that's good for us because it's all a lie anyway. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a really 
cynical strategy that you're seeing um, on the right. Um, and, and if you think about the way that their news is constantly uh, berating the Democratic Party, you know, politics is war and they cheat, um, you know, that whole frame is all about creating cynicism. Um, so the, the dominant figure um, is to quote Quay. I know you guys like figures. <laughs> um, and yeah. that's the appeal. <laughs> I was going to not say it, but it's to quote Quay. And I know no, you like say it, say it. to say it again. <laughs> um, and that's the appeal to hypocrisy. And um, I may have talked about this with you before, but it's such an important thing to understand because it's an ad hominem fallacy. So it's attacking the person instead of their argument. And it's a redirection strategy. So all ad fallacies, the word ad means to. And so you reroute our attention from the central issue to the person of the accuser or the debate partner, whatever. Um, and so a tu quo que is a form of that. It says, they always cheat. They always lie. You can't trust them. It doesn't matter what they say about us because we know that they are cheaters and liars, right? right. And so it's absolutely fundamental and it's instrumental to how their narrative works. Everything is built upon that because if you admit that your enemy um, you know, has some redeeming qualities, that they are truthful in some way, then everything falls apart, right? Then you can't condemn them. You can't get your people to, you know, like you said, sort of switch opinions, um, you know, at the drop of a hat. Um, and, and so it's, it's always the message. The message is always that they're hypocrites. And that's like when you say enemy that like really is so striking because that really is what it is now like you know they keep using the word war and and it's like we're all in the same country we're all supposed to be on the same side supposedly um and what is striking to me too is that okay there it's a bipartisan committee there are two republicans <laughs> on it but they keep saying that it's not bipartisan. And like, so what is this now? Like to be a true Republican, you have to be with Trump. Otherwise you're not. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So they would say they're rhinos and um, you know, these are two Republicans who have rejected the narrative that has been put forth. Right. And they have accepted reality and they are willing to defend reality or at least investigate, um, you know, what happened within a reality frame. Um, and so that's unacceptable. Right. Because their evidence that, um, you know, the enemy is tricky, <laughs> they can co-opt. Um, right. That there can be some of them inside of our you know, team or whatever, um, you know, and so the, the enemies within they are trying to sabotage us. Right. Well, that segues um, <laughs> distressingly <laughs> into my next question. <laughs> um, yeah, two of the most powerful, really just heart wrenching parts of yesterday's hearing were the descriptions of the racist abuse that both officers of color had hurled at them. And this is the, the us and them and mm -hmm. um, that war footing. Um, Officer Dunn has served on the Capitol Police Force since 2008, and Officer Gunnell is also a uh, Capitol Police officer and an immigrant to the U.S. from the Dominican Republic who served in the Iraq War. And they were being told that they aren't Americans, they're not patriots. Can, can you explain the purpose of the othering of these two officers and why that made that day so much more dangerous for them, even than the white officers who were there. Yeah, um, you know, so the whole uh, us versus them narrative is a narrative of polarization. And uh, the Republican Party has found it very convenient and it to be very successful to polarize, you know, based on partisan affiliation to polarize based on religion, right? There's all kinds of ways that they choose to polarize. Um, and since the emergence of the Southern strategy in the 1970s, 1960s, sorry, um, you have polarization along racial lines. 
right? And, um, you know, it's, it's very clearly a part of the strategy. It's one that they choose to deny, right, outwardly. They would never admit it. Um, they did once upon a time, but they certainly don't now. Um, and so you activate your partisans along racial lines. Um, and, you know, it, again, fascinating to observe as a rhetorician and to look at clinically and see, you know, wow, look at how they deny the existence of race, <laughs> right? And they say, we don't, we don't see color. We just want to, um, you know, have, you know, ban critical race theory because it, it's trying to polarize us versus about race. Um, you know, while at the same time, they're activating people based on racial identity. Um, so one of the stories that I tell in my book, and it's really, um, I mean, it was a bummer of a story to write, um, it, and it provides a kind of emotional, like flip, I think, in the story arc of the book on Trump, is the story about him and white nationalists, right? And so he was able to embrace them. He was able to use their talking points. He was able to recirculate and amplify their memes while also saying that, you know, he loved African Americans and that, you know, he was the least racist person who ever lived, um, right? Um, as all and, and so, people have to say. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and it's very similar to what you hear from Tucker Carlson right now and other people who are, um, you know, questioning critical race theory. And it's that um, I'm not saying I'm just saying that we talked about the use of paralypsis, the use of irony to say two things at once. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, so when those people attacked the officers at the Capitol, um, you know, of course, they're going to go for what to them is, you know, the most polarizing, worst thing you can say, um, right? Which is to deny the humanity of the officers, which is what they were doing. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think your point is really valid that the, the experience of the white officers and the black officers was absolutely different in that, you know, there's this extra racial component where they're being dehumanized as they're being attacked. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's unfathomable and, um, and yeah, it was painful yeah. to, it was painful <laughs> to, to watch those hearings and, and then to see also how they still, um, are there defending democracy, right? Like they've been othered, yeah. but they're like, no, I, I belong here and, and I, and I'm going to continue to fight regardless of, of, of what who they're protecting they're not asking like oh are you a republican are you democrat like they're just about protecting they're about the job um this violence and this polarization um continues now because trump i get his emails uh he writes to me personally he says friend hey friend um <laughs> And, and it, he hasn't let up since the whole stop the steal rhetoric, rhetoric. Is he priming his followers right now for more violence? Because it kind of feels that way. Yeah, I mean, some of them think that he's going to become president in August. Um, August is like next week. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> he, uh, he, he absolutely has not let up on the stop the steal campaign. Um, he has... He continues to deny reality, as you would expect it to do, I guess. Um, what I've realized in the last few weeks is that we should really be calling him the pretender to the presidency. So just like those monarchs who were deposed um, and yet continued to claim that they were actually the legitimate king, um, you know, Trump was legally voted out of office um, and he refuses to admit it. He refuses to agree with it. He claims that he is the rightful ruler of America, that he is the actual president. Um, we've never had one in American history. <laughs> we've never had one of these. And uh, I don't know what happens next in the scenario. We've never had someone who denied the legitimacy of a legitimate election before. We've never had a president claim to be president when they were not. Uh, we've never had a former president refuse to leave office. Like we don't have a script for how to handle this. And I don't think that um, anybody actually knows what to do. Um, We've that's, never had a pretender to the presidency. Right. That's, that's a sobering thought, but it also makes me feel a little bit better because I know I'm not the only one going, oh my God, what are we going to do? Um, so I tell people, no one knows. No one knows. 
That's um, the problem. So, <laughs> that is the problem. So uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders wrote an op-ed uh, that I can't wait to get your opinion on. We do have to go to a break. So everybody will be right back with uh, Jennifer Murchia and her take on this op-ed. Um, but first, our next Offs Award nominee and a quick word from the Lincoln Project. Our next Oh For Fuck's Sake nominee is Marjorie Taylor Greene. In her trademark dim-witted and disturbing style, Marge nailed cruel and crazy as she cackled when asked about young, healthy people now dying from COVID. And in a drama performed entirely in her own head, Marge plays the heroine in Fire Fauci, a farcical comedy about a woman so desperate for attention that she teams up with a giant teenage girl chasing head for a national tour. Oh, guys, this is wrong. She, she's actually doing this. Is Rupert Murdoch trying to kill Americans? His network is the leading voice against COVID vaccination. How many Americans have died after taking the COVID vaccine? Going door to door, this is creepy stuff. The focus of this administration on vaccination is uh, mind boggling. The Americans who are dying from COVID are almost all not vaccinated. Rupert Murdoch was vaccinated. Does anyone really think Tucker Carlson isn't vaccinated? But Murdoch's Fox News continues to put Americans at risk by pushing anti-vax hysteria. It's dangerous, immoral. Fox News is helping kill Americans. Call your local television provider and tell them to drop Fox News. It's not about politics. It's about life and death. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. Welcome back to We're Speaking. We are here with Jennifer Murchia. Uh, we're talking about the January 6th insurrection, the committee hearings that just started. And uh, we are going to talk about nobody's favorite person now. <laughs> Not at all. So in the second half, I don't know if y'all remember rhetoric tricks, um, but this is our our game that we play. It's a fun way to learn about these rhetorical devices. And Jennifer Murchia is here to help us out with that. So Sarah Huckabee Sanders in an op-ed wrote, based on the advice of my doctor, I determined that the benefits of getting vaccinated outweighed any potential risk. I was also reassured after President Trump and his family were vaccinated. If getting vaccinated was safe enough for them, I felt it was safe enough for me. This smacks of verbal trickery. What is, what is she doing here? What's she trying to pull? Well, so it was actually an interesting op-ed. So, you know, going back to that idea of the manufacturer of dissent that we were talking about before. So there's been this narrative, this reality on the right that says, you know, don't trust the vaccine, you shouldn't get vaccinated. Who knows, right? Um, but now all of a sudden in the last two weeks, they've been like, actually, you should be getting vaccinated. <laughs> um, and so that causes cognitive dissonance, right? So cognitive dissonance is where you cannot hold two incompatible ideas in your head at the same time. It makes you feel uncomfortable um, and it makes you, you know, confused. And so you want to resolve that cognitive dissonance. And so what I saw that um, op-ed trying to do was to help the audience um, to help people of Arkansas to resolve their cognitive dissonance that they have, which they would of course feel because of all of the months of everything from Fox, um, by essentially blaming Democrats, um, right? And so they're easy to blame because of course they cheat. Um, we all know that, um, so you can blame them for everything. And so it was always, so her argument is essentially, Trump invented the vaccine, uh, Trump, you know, developed it and the Democrats said that he couldn't and then he shouldn't and that he wouldn't. Um, but, you know, we knew that he could and he did. And, uh, you know, and so you should take 
the vaccine because it's sensible, but also because this authority figure has said to do so, right? So it's an appeal to authority. Um, it's also called anchoring, which is where you connect an idea to, um, you know, a high profile or high status person. But so the whole front part of the op-ed is all about blaming the Democrats, um, you know, for, for not supporting Trump. Um, and then claiming, of course, that we always believed in the vaccine because it was Trump's vaccine. Um, and so therefore we will reasonably all take the vaccine. And it's ridiculous, right? But I, I, I actually don't mind it if people take the vaccine. Like if that actually helps people to resolve the cognitive dissonance that they're feeling and it motivates them to go get protected, then I'm okay with that. I mean, yeah, you have this, to say this is one of the rare occasions. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the rare occasions where the priming is actually priming people to do the right thing. So, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it's we'll, at least we'll, the right we'll thing. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. So here's the next one. Uh, this was Congressman Jim Jordan uh, on Fox News yesterday. He had just been asked whether he spoke with Donald Trump on January 6th. Let's go ahead and roll the clip. Who knew what, when? Who was talking to coordinators of the protest? Did you talk to the former president that day? I've talked to the former president <coughs> umpteen times, thousands. I mean, I may not thousands I mean, on times, January but countless, 6th. countless times. I talked to the president. I never talk about what we talk about, because I just don't think that's appropriate. Just like I don't talk about what happens in Republican conferences. So sure. I've talked to the president numerous times. Uh, I continue to talk to the president. No, no, since no I he's mean left on office. January 6th, Congressman. Yes. Uh yeah. So. Other than manic and nervous and evasive and you know, <laughs> yeah, that's strategy. Call what it was that Jim Jordan was just doing. I don't think there's a name for that. Um, I think <laughs> I, I think he was trying to be a big shot. Um, you know, I always talk to the president. I talk to him so much. But I also think maybe that was. Yeah, I think maybe that was just miscommunication. It was unclear to me if he really understood that he was saying that he talked to him on January 6th, um, and, or if he did and he didn't intend to, and then he was trying to cover it up. Um, that, whole, that whole thing was a mess to me. Um, all I can tell you is he's trying to be a big shot. I don't think there's a Latin or Greek term for that. Yeah, we'll I got the sense that one. while the question was being asked and he was trying to answer it, he's thinking, okay, if I say that I did this, my God, I'm gonna get subpoenaed. How do I not, how do I be a big shot and say yeah. Trump was supposed to talk to me yeah. at the same time, not end up in front of the committee? Just keep talking fast and yeah. talk through it. <laughs> exactly, I was gonna say, I, I wanna have a, like that's fastest talkingness is the, or fast talking them, we're gonna coin that. <laughs> so we have, we have another one. Uh, so Elise Stefanik stood at a podium and had a press conference and made this crazy accusation that somehow it was Nancy Pelosi's fault. Can we look at that clip? She prioritized her partisan political optics over their safety. The American people deserve to know the truth that Nancy Pelosi bears responsibility as Speaker of the House for the tragedy that occurred on January 6th. And it was only after Republicans started asking these important questions that she refused to seat them. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> is that shit crazy? <laughs> uh, is that that shit a rhetoric? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> like unbearable liar? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So within the manufacture of dissent frame, right, that that statement makes sense. It makes no sense in reality. Um, and so there's that. Um, but what it is as a rhetorical strategy is a red herring. And a red herring is a distraction strategy. You know, it's again, you know, don't look over here, look over here. Um, and uh, it's just a way of trying to lead your audience down a different path. Um, you know, and uh, predictable, unfortunately, right? Um, again, you know, I don't think that the Republican Party in their version of reality could accept the legitimacy of the investigation. 
right? If you accept the legitimacy of the investigation, you have to accept that there was something wrong, that something needs to be investigated. Um, they can never accept that, right? And so you see just a thousand different ways to spin and to simulate um, to try to, you know, see what can stick. Um, and one of the things that I think has been so fascinating in watching how they do that, um, you know, is that they, they constantly show um, video of the events of the day that look benign, right? That look banal. So they describe the people there as tourists. And if you only watch right-wing media, you would only see images of reality on that day that looked banal, that looked like they were just tourists, um, you know, and that makes it seem like nothing bad happened. And at the same time um, that those same stations are showing only images of Black Lives Matter protests that look like, you know, they were dangerous, violent, insurrectory kinds of riots. Um, and so you constantly see these images. Um, there's a media theory called cultivation theory that tells us that, you know, we don't have direct experience with reality. Um, most of it is presented to us from television. So the images that we see on TV become what we think, you know, actually happen. The more you see an image, the more it's reinforced, right? And so when they can say, oh, they were just tourists, in your mind, what you're going to see is the image of, you know, people kind of wandering through Statuary Hall, having a good time, um, and being uh, nonviolent. Um, when they say that Black Lives Matter protests were so violent, um, and here we are, you know, we're going to investigate this instead of that. Um, it's going to call to mind for you images of a burning car, right, which was shown on loop um, repeatedly. Um, and, and so they have primed their audience to understand reality in a very specific way. And then they use triggering words that call back those images um, that reinforces, right, that version of reality that they think they know. Um, and so it does, it sounds bizarre and ludicrous to us because we're not a part of that discourse community, but that's exactly what they've been doing. It's very that effective. Is, it's incredibly effective. It's, uh, and I'm, I was actually taking notes for myself as you were talking. So I hope everybody who's watching is also taking notes because <laughs> that is, it's, it's, I'm like assuming they probably have people on their staff who do these kind of things and kind of instruct them in how to do it because like, it's like those trigger words and those images, the way it all plays together. This is like incredible information. I cannot wait for us to have you back again and again and again because there's so <laughs> much to learn. There's so much to learn. And the more we know about this, the easier it right. is this to is talk what to you our do. friends and family. Yeah. To, right. We're saying, you know, to, you do, this is what you do. We, we yeah. educate ourselves, we understand what it is that's going on. And you are such an incredible resource for us to have you make us you make thank us smarter you. and you make us a step closer to getting so where smart. we need to be. So thank you. I feel smarter. Thanks. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks it's my ever. pleasure. It's always a joy to talk with you. So thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. She does make smarter. us smarter. And, so yeah, and and armed with information, right? It's yeah. really, really important that we understand what um, these folks are doing and how people are being manipulated because it, it better prepares us to not have that done to us and to find ways to diffuse it and dissemble it. One of the yep. terms that Jennifer's taught us is manufacturing dissent. Uh, well, that dissent is paid for by big corporate contributions uh, many companies that pledge to turn off their donations to the 147 member sedition caucus are right back at it, stuffing campaign coffers full, um, you know, to hell with what that's doing to our democracy. So here's a call to action for you tonight. Tell your cable or streaming provider to drop Fox news drop it yes because fox doesn't depend on their advertisers to make money they get it from you yeah whether whether you like it or not um when you pay your monthly fees to either your cable company or your streaming services fox gets a piece of of your money you are helping yeah. to pay the salaries of tucker carlson and laura ingram and keep them on the air which is horrifying but true yeah, so please tweet your provider to drop Fox News or you'll drop them. We need everybody doing that. Uh, 
please. Yeah, <laughs> please use the hashtag. We're speaking when you do it, add your voice. Um, there's huge power in numbers. We talk about this a lot. And, um, and when you do tweet those, those providers, you know, feel free to tell them that the Lincoln Project sent you just, you know, our big wet kiss to the. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and we know it's difficult to do the right thing, that it can be inconvenient. Um, and we were talking about this and we're like, there should be an app for that. Uh, let's take a look at that. <laughs> And on my way to UPS to ship the package. UPS? Lisa, no. They support the insurrectionists. They gave $10,000 to Kevin McCarthy. Don't you like democracy? I do, but UPS is literally right around the corner from my house. Am I really going to drive an extra mile just to do the right thing? I mean... Is democracy worth another 10 minutes in the car? Girl, don't you have Fash app? They pay you to do the right thing. Wait, what? Fash app. You heard that right. Dozens of companies promised to stop donating money to the 147 members of the GOP who voted to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election. But then they kept on giving. We know you love democracy, but we know you're busy, so we'll pay you. Fascia. When you don't want to support the companies that support the fascists. My time is valuable. I can't spend it worrying about which companies are giving money to members of Congress who tried to overturn the election. And I can't even Google to figure out which companies aren't funding the fascists. Because Google is. Fascia. Because your love doesn't come cheap, even love of country. We raise money from selling George P. Bush's tears and give it to you for doing the right thing. I'm on my parents' phone plan. They don't care if AT&T and Verizon are funding the fascists, and it's saving me a lot of money. Fash app. Get Paid to Save Democracy is the number one app for raising money to pay you to do the right thing. Download the app now to find out how much we'll pay you to switch. Fashion. Fashion. <laughs> we we're going to take this ridiculous. to Shark Tank. Yeah, we're going to Silicon Valley <laughs> right. with this. Except for their own. Make sure you do the voice. Yeah. Fashion. Fashion. Um, yes. And just in case that was not ridiculous enough, it is now time for our last Oh For Fuck's Sake nominee. Rounding out this week's offs is Rand Paul. <laughs> He played the part of tackled neighbor in Fight with an Anesthesiologist. But he's not worried about being typecast as the dueling doctor because now he's taking on the starring role in Get Fauci. He had the optical nerve, see what I did there, to accuse Dr. Fauci of lying to Congress. Well, thank goodness Rand is an ophthalmologist because when he recommended Dr. Fauci to the Justice Department, all all of America's eyes rolls out of our collective heads. Congrats on your nomination, Rand. Republicans are not budging from their opposition to a special commission. Republicans don't want to give the imprimatur of bipartisanship to investigate the deadly riot on Capitol Hill. They're hugging and kissing the police and the guards. You know, they they had great relationships. Who funds the politicians trying to cover up the assault on America's Capitol? Who fills the bank accounts of groups fighting to restrict minority voting rights? Some of the leaders of the most respected and successful companies in America, companies who laud their own diversity efforts, evangelize their devotion to inclusion, and extol their purported virtue and integrity. Companies led by people like Stephen Schwartzman. He gave over $40 million to Donald Trump, Mitch McConnell, and the GOP machine, helping finance the very structure that led to the murderous violence on January 6th. Stephen Schwartzman wasn't the only industry leader that contributed to the authoritarian GOP. He's just the first we've named, and far from the last. Schwartzman and these other leaders can contribute their money to whatever causes and politicians they choose. Donating even to bad people is their right, just as telling you who they are and what they did is ours.
Rick, you and everyone else who follows the Lincoln Project knows that I come from a law enforcement family. Yes, you do. My husband is a you black federal this. officer. You got this. My grandfather served this country for 40 years as a police officer. And I watch that even now. And it's tough. Because I look at these people in, in America who are supposed to be our fellow countrymen. Yeah. Sit here and try to deny what happened to those officers who put their lives on the line to protect those bastards that are sitting here trying to tell them that that didn't happen, that it was tourists. Yeah. You know, Abraham Lincoln said, nations do not die from invasion. They die from internal rottenness. Um, yeah. You can, sorry, got me again. Every time I've watched that, so powerful. If you didn't see last night's episode, go back and watch it. The whole thing was incredibly powerful. You can catch the breakdown tomorrow with Rick and Tara at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, and tonight we are talking about the January 6th uh, insurrection, the domestic terrorist attack on our capital and the people who enabled it. The stakes are enormous and we have to continue fighting. We absolutely do. Um, and it's going to take all of us investing our time, energy, and resources to win the fight for democracy. So we asked you to tell us about the America you love and why it's worth fighting for. And here are some of your responses. Renee uh, or Orozco wrote, the America I love is full of possibilities where an immigrant like my dad could become a citizen and build a business where I could be given opportunities that were unlikely for a woman, let alone an immigrant's daughter the year I was born. I have walked into meeting rooms as the only woman and at times the only brown person. That, pers that people like me are given a seat at the table not only makes America better, it makes the world better. That is the America I'm willing to fight for. Um, and we have Pam Threadgill. Our country is a great gift to our families and friends. It is a land of opportunity and freedom. We almost lost our democracy with the acts of the former president. We should never take it for granted. Be vigilant and stand our ground to keep our fun country free for generations. And Miriam Brown wrote, thanking those who let me be a woman, a Christian, a left-handed person, a person with disabilities, and not be persecu persecuted for those freedoms. Um, those are incredibly powerful. Um, my daughter was born abroad and I brought her back to the US when she was six because I wanted her to experience a multiracial democracy. And watching it fall apart uh, while we've been here has been incredibly difficult. And it is incredibly powerful to see people speak their truth online on, uh, on our social media to share with us these stories. And I honestly, I want to hear more of these, even when we're not asking for them. If you ever feel like you yeah. just want to like share and engage, like please do, uh, because we're all going through it right now in different ways and feeling othered in trying to say, hey, we belong here too. And so I appreciate hearing those stories from all of you. Yeah, and it's it's that community that we're building. Everybody needs to be able to feel a part of community right now, and it's having the power of that community that's going to get us out of this because we are going to work together and we are going to preserve the America that we should have. Yeah. 100%. Um, and in order to do so, we're going to have to stop people like these uh, Offs Award winners. Uh, so let's go to let's go to the winner of this week's Offs Award. Our O oh, for fuck's sake winner this week is Tucker Carlson. Now, let me tell you, it takes no ordinary hate-filled line racist to beat Marjorie Taylor Greene for this award. Really shitty job, Tuck. This elite school trust-funded white supremacist authoritarian anti-vaxxer is not one to just sit back and be satisfied with 
the deaths he's already contributed to. Actually, we hear Tucker's performance is never satisfying, even to Tucker. So while Fox is turning down the anti-vax rhetoric, Tucker's dialing it up. So in the words of your favorite fan who went viral this week, Tuck, you are the worst human being known to man or woman. That accurate. So deserving. Like, yeah. The guy, you know, he might not really work hard, but he works hard for that. And, you know, nice to give people credit where it's due. Um, and we have we have one other thing that you know we've really been concerned about um yeah have you heard about the latest drug that's sweeping the nation do you know how to spot the signs that your loved ones are taking it you know and we're here for you and mm -hmm. and because we care um we produced a psa to help have a look yeah. do you or a loved one suffer from decreasing integrity a decline in critical thinking skills, or the fear of a multiracial democracy? Are you unbothered by white supremacists, neo-fascism, and Elise Stefanik? If so, you might have been infected by Fox News, a weaponized virus first detected in Rupert Murdoch's brain. Designed to use fear to deceive and manipulate viewers, the virus attacks critical thinking receptors, leaving those exposed unable to detect hypocrisy or recognize truth. And if not stopped, it can lead to freedom, a delirious state in which people shout out Fox talking points. It might cause you to believe that science is tyranny, COVID is a hoax, Donald Trump is a winner. And in extreme cases, it may be fatal. Freedom can be contracted from watching Fox News, listening to Republican governors, or taking a selfie with Matt Gates. But help is here. Doses of truth are available and can be administered by reputable news sources, leaders with integrity, friends and family with a grip on reality, and as a last resort, common sense. Just a dose of truth. We can get we can yeah. get to them. We can get there. And you know, <laughs> as usual, as a last resort, common sense. Yeah. That does seem it's out too there often too. The way it's yeah. being used. Yeah. Not so common. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uncommon sense. Um this has been an amazing season for us. Uh tough mm -hmm. stuff, but great to be uh, getting through it with all of you. We started mm -hmm. out in the long uh, shadow of the hateful, racist, anti-American um, January 6th insurrection and continued with the ongoing march by Republicans toward authoritarianism. Yeah, you know, it's during this whole time, a lot of us has gone from like this whole like, it can't happen here. And this isn't who we are. Do you remember that back in January six? And people were like, we're not this. And I think we've reached the point now where we're like, it is happening here. Right? We've acknowledged that. And if this isn't who we are, well, it's time to stand up and prove it. You know, and we've learned a ton uh, with renowned historians and scholars um, like Ruth ben Giat and Applebaum and tonight's guest, Jennifer Murcia. Um, they really have shed light on authoritarian movements. What we all need to be understanding are their tools and tactics and the language they use so we can make sure we can defend the democracy. Yeah, it's important. We've also talked to political activists like Pam Keith and Christina Sanders, who showed us the work that needs to be done on the ground to save our democracy and by example, how to actually do that. And we've also talked to educators and political commentators like Melissa Harris Perry. She was amazing. She helped ground us in American history and challenged us to keep working to create a more just, more free and more perfect union. Yeah, they inspire us um, also to raise chickens because she's doing that and that seems to be working for her. <laughs> um, 
I was like, oh, I was like, is this how I'm going to get through this? I need to raise chickens. Um, but and bake. in addition, <laughs> yes, and bake, exactly. Everybody, I need to know their hobbies. Uh, but we're also incredibly inspired by all of you um, who are making up this growing, we're speaking community of pro democracy supporters and activists, uh, which is why we're so excited about expanding on how we connect with you uh, all in season three. Yeah, the the inspiring has led to conspiring and we're figuring out ways we're we're not only um, in our in show interaction going to increase, but we are going to take this movement into the real world. You've shown us all season long that you've got a lot to say. We want to hear it and we want to help you do it. Yeah. So we're going to be taking a break, but we're going to be working very hard on that uh, during the break. And then we will be back with season three very soon. And in the meantime, you're not going to get rid of us. Uh, look for, apparently Maya and I can't completely take a break. Um, yeah. Look for live Q&As with experts that we're going to be doing, helping us preserve and defend the democracy. They will be hosted by me and Maya because it is it's just too hard to stay away from all of you so we will uh we're gonna be regular faces yeah we'll see y'all soon <laughs>